When I was a kid, I wanted to be a reporter. I could say it was because of the noble role of the public watchdog or championing First Amendment freedoms, but truth be told, I'm just nosy. And I, I like to know the real story and share the story with people who don't know it so we're all on the same page. So if you think about it, it wasn't a big leap for me to become a teacher because that's also what teachers do, isn't it? They know the real story and they try to bring everybody up to speed. After a few years in the classroom, I came to love education so much that not only was I a teacher, I became a teacher of teachers and worked in professional development. Now, I say teacher of teachers loosely because honestly, I learned so much more from the teachers that I worked with than they learned from me. And I had the privilege of working with educators from across the United States and eight countries, from Afghanistan to Uganda. And I learned that no matter what campus you go on to, no matter what school you're at, if you ask the staff, who's the best teacher here, they can always tell you. And when I ask, well, what makes them the best teacher? They give you an answer along the lines of, they always get results. But there's nothing quite like an answer that just leads to another question, which is, why do they always get results? What makes great teachers great? And what makes their instruction meaningful? So even though uh, I was heading an international nonprofit at the time, the nosy reporter in me got the best of me because this was a question I wanted to have answered. So I did a lot of research and I was especially excited by the work of Dr. William Glasser and what he wrote about quality schools. But that just made me want to know more. So I decided uh, to take an opportunity to embed myself in a public inner city high school in Brooklyn, New York for two years where I wouldn't just do research as a casual observer, I would actually roll up my sleeves and be in the mix to really focus on what makes instruction meaningful and learn from other teachers. After my time in Brooklyn, I embedded myself for an additional year at a private middle school in Tampa, Florida. My thinking was that the polar opposite demographics would help bring validity to my findings. After three years embedded in a classroom, and after a year of analyzing the results, I can say with confidence, I know what makes instruction meaningful. And the answer shocks me. It turns out that we all learn exactly the same way. Now this flew in the face of years of instruction that I'd received that everybody learns differently. Now, learning styles, prior knowledge, uh, social economics factors, all of these come into play in how learning is manifested. But whether you are a baby boomer, Gen Xer, millennial, inner city, suburban, every human being will master content. Let me say that again. Every human being will master content if instruction has five critical characteristics. First, truly meaningful instruction is real world. And by that I mean the student can see a reason outside of the classroom for learning what's going on inside of the classroom. Second, meaningful instruction is hard work. The students are not throwing it together the night before. They've been working on it a long time because there's a real risk of failure. Third, meaningful instruction is unpredictable. The answer cannot be looked up in the back of the book because it's not there. So the student doesn't know how the work is supposed to come out. It's especially unpredictable if the teacher doesn't know how the work is supposed to come out. Fourth, meaningful instruction is student-driven, meaning the learner is making substantive decisions about how the work is done, and how they demonstrate mastery of what they've learned. Five, and this is the big one, truly meaningful instruction 
is an emotional experience for the learner, meaning that the student has an emotional interaction with the content while they learn it. We've always known that when your brain takes in a new piece of information, the first thing it does is it looks for a pattern. What is this like? So it knows where to file it in long-term memory. If it doesn't see a pattern, it will file it into short-term memory to buy you time. After a certain period of time, if you haven't figured out where to file it over here, it's going to dump it out of short-term memory and is completely forgotten. Hopefully after the quiz in that class and not before. But it's gone. Research by Eric Jensen and Dr. Pierce Howard shows that when your brain takes in a new piece of information in an emotional setting, that information bypasses short-term memory and goes directly into long-term memory. That's quite a trick, isn't it? Wouldn't it be great as a teacher or a parent to say, hey, I've got some really important information. In fact, I'm just going to open up your brain and stick it right into long-term memory so you'll always have it. You're welcome. <laughs> it turns out we can do just that. Many years ago, I was a sophomore at Piper High School in Sunrise, Florida. I was sitting in a biology class taught by Mr. Tony Arrigo. And on this particular day, he was talking about scalp fungus and how it gets transmitted from one person to another. Okay, some of you are already having an emotional interaction with the content. That's terrific. <laughs> he said, I want you to imagine this five-year-old kid who has a scalp fungus, and you know because there's a hole in his hair where you can see his scalp. And he goes in to watch a movie in a theater, and he scrunches down in the seat and puts his head on the back. He watches the movie. He leaves. You come in for the next showing. You scrunch down in the seat. You get the scalp fungus. <laughs> like 50 of you just shot straight up in your seats. <laughs> I don't know what grade I got on the quiz that came after, but I guarantee you I got the scalp fungus question right. <laughs> to this day, I can't scrunch down in a theater seat. <laughs> because Mr. Arico is lodged in my brain. What a gift. <laughs> the one that keeps giving. <laughs> Teachers cannot write emotional interaction in the content in their lesson plan. That's unfortunate, but they can create conditions like Mr. Arico did, where it's likely for emotional interaction to happen. What if you're not a teacher? What if you're a parent or a grandparent or an older sibling? You have a role to play too. Years later, when my daughter Natalie was in third grade, she had a science project to do. And she was always interested in cars, even from a young age. And she decided she wanted to see if the width of a wheelbase on a car would make it more stable. So her brother Philip had a racetrack set, and we commandeered that, and we set it up in her room, and she started running cars around the track, and they would fly off, and she'd count how many times they'd fly off on a curve. And after every time, she'd push the wheelbase out just a little wider. And what she discovered was that the wider the wheelbase, the fewer times the car will fly off the track on a curve when it's at speed. She called it fast on fours. And she references that science project to this day, even though she's almost 30. There was a lot of emotion in the process of learning that. There was the excitement of running the experiments. There was the thrill of doing important work that was uniquely hers. And I like to think there was some pretty awesome father-daughter time involved as well. And I know that's what makes it stand out in my mind. So in the process of that, she learned an important principle of physics. So how can we help cause meaningful instruction to occur in even greater numbers throughout our schools? Well, for one thing, policymakers can help facilitate this by shifting the focus 
away from high stakes testing, micromanagement and compliance, back to where it should be, supporting teachers in the classroom and creating truly meaningful instruction. Second, Second, if you are an administrator, you're under a lot of heat, especially in the current political climate, how our government and communities are looking at schools. Your main job as an administrator is to act like styrofoam, insulate your teachers from the heat, don't pass it on, because when teachers feel safe and protected, they will unleash their creativity in the classroom and indulge in their art with reckless abandon. And if you are a parent, a grandparent, or an older sibling, you can play an important part when you have your student come home in the afternoon from school, help them with their homework. Don't just make sure that it gets done, but sit with them and actively learn with them. Many parents are hesitant to do this because they don't want their child to see that they don't know something. But there's no more powerful an example that we can set for young people in our homes than to sit with them and actively learn and show them that the process of learning is a gift and something to be cherished throughout life. If I've done my job well today, you've had an emotional interaction with the concept somewhere along the way. And maybe years from now, you'll be telling somebody, one time, I heard this amazing TED Talks. <laughs> I can't remember that guy's name, but I remember one thing for sure. Never scrunch down in a theater seat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>